Thank you. Can everybody hear me? That's my only gift is a loud voice. I do get good looks, I do get intelligence, I got a loud voice. Um, my name is Bruce Green, I am a retired history teacher, and I made an interest in the Holocaust um, back in the mid-80s. We had a speaker come to our school who was a survivor of Auschwitz and spoke to the students. And from that point, I, I kind of took it upon myself to learn more about the Holocaust. I, I went to a number of um, Holocaust teacher workshops over the years. Um, I used to take my students up to the Fairless Holocaust Museum in Terre Haute. I had, I'll fix it this way. I had uh, the opportunity over the years to meet and hear the stories of quite a number of Holocaust survivors. And then I had the opportunity in 2015 to travel to Auschwitz, to Poland, with Eva Ford. And Eva, a lot of you have probably heard of Eva speak, or some of you probably have. Uh, Eva was a resident of Terrell, Indiana, but she was a survivor of Auschwitz. She and her twin sister, Marianne, were part of Dr. Mengele's uh, experiments at Auschwitz. So I had the opportunity to travel to Auschwitz with Eva and I got to tour that terrible place with a survivor of that. And then I had the opportunity to go back again in 2017 with her. So I was actually there twice. Now they have a, a made a documentary about Eva and actually made it on the second trip I went to. It's called Eva A7063. And, uh, it, I'm not sure where all it's available right now, but uh, it tells her story. So if you haven't heard her story, that's, that's a great place to, to see it. I'm just in front of a large group of adults before, so bear with me. I think uh, to talk about Auschwitz, we have to put it in perspective of the Holocaust uh, in general. So I'm going to talk about the Holocaust to some people uh, that helped uh, uh, orchestrate that, that terrible uh, happening in history. I want you to listen to the numbers when I talk here today, because the numbers tell the story. The numbers that are killed, the numbers uh, that were kept in these camps, the new to slave labor. Twelve million people were murdered in the Holocaust. Six million of them were Jewish. Other groups that were killed in the Holocaust included the Roma, the Gypsies, uh, the Poles, political prisoners, homosexuals, disabled, Jehovah's Witnesses, among other groups. After World War I, Germany had problems. Um, the Treaty of Versailles put some, some real restraints on them, especially economically. Um, and they were suffering economically, and then worldwide depression hits. And that just kind of creates a much larger economic uh, problem in Germany. So this new party has developed after World War I called the Nazi Party. And they developed this theory that a group of people caused these problems. And they sell that to the German people, that the Jewish people were the problem. Now let me give you some numbers. This is the 1933 numbers. The, the entire Jewish population of Europe was only 1.7% in 1933. The Jewish population of Germany was only less than 1%. Yet, they were used as a scapegoat, and it was sold to people. We always look for excuses when things don't go our way. And the German people were offered an excuse, and they grabbed it, and they ran with it. 
1933, Adolf Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany, and in the same year, the first concentration camps were built and opened. Dachau was, was one of the very first. These camps were originally established to imprison those that were considered dangerous to Germany. And then in 1935, the Nuremberg Laws were passed. The Nuremberg Laws were anti-Jewish laws. They took away German citizenship from Jewish people. They wouldn't allow uh, Aryans and Jews to marry. They forced, uh, or they identified who was a Jewish person. They even created charts that said if your great-grandmother was Jewish and so on, it, that told it who was a Jewish person, according to these charts. Um, it was based, the Nuremberg Laws were basically legalized persecution. Then on November 9th and 10th, 1938, Kristallnacht happened. Kristallnacht, known as Night of Broken Glass, was an organized attack on Jewish synagogues, businesses, uh, homes, and people. On that night, 30,000 Jewish men were arrested and taken to concentration camps. It was an intimidation move. They were trying to persuade, through intimidation, Jewish people to immigrate out of Germany at that point. The gentleman you see in this picture, that is uh, Walter Summers. Walter was a Terre Haute, Indiana resident, passed away in February of this year at the age of 101. He was a docent at the Candles Holocaust Museum for many years, but he was an eyewitness to Kristallnacht. He was a teenager in Hamburg, Germany, on the night of Kristallnacht, and his father was arrested and taken to a concentration camp. He was later released, and they were lucky that they had family in the United States and were able to get papers to leave Germany and come to the United States. Once he came to the United States and reached age, he joined the United States Army and he served in the Pacific Theater during World War II in the U.S. Army. So I just have him up there because he is a survivor of this and he spent many years telling his story at uh, the Candles Holocaust Museum. So between 1939 and 1942, World War II began on September 1st, 1939 when Germany invaded Poland. Also then, shortly after that, the first ghettos were established in Poland. Now a ghetto was the fencing off, the cordoning off of a section of a city and putting all of the Jewish people inside that section of the city. People who used to have their own homes now were living several families to small apartments. Food was scarce. Sanitation was bad. They were taken out to work and brought back in in the evening. So that's, when you hear of a ghetto, that's what we're talking about. Uh, also in 1939, the Einsatzgruppen was formed. The Nazi killing squads. Uh, and I'll talk a little more about those in a minute. And then, in May of 1940, Auschwitz was opened. The concentration camp. Then in January of 1942, the Wannsee Conference was held just outside Berlin, uh, and it was to develop the final solution, and I'll talk more about that right now, because the final uh, solution resulted in a state bureaucracy all working together for one purpose, and that was to annihilate a group of people, the Jewish people. They put so much effort and time and manpower and money into this to make this happen. I mean, if, if you think about the realm of the Holocaust, as you're going to see as we go through some of this, 
the, the effort that was put into these mass killings is astounding. Um, so the final solution was to get rid of a whole group of people, the Jewish people and others that were considered undesirable. And the conditions in these camps were brutal and they were designed, the concentration camps were designed only for temporary survival. This guy, we've got to talk about if you're going to talk about the Holocaust. This is Reinhard Heydrich. He worked his way up the ranks of the Nazi party. He became the head of the security police main office, which oversaw all police matters in the Reich and the intelligence departments. Anybody considered dangerous to the Reich, he was on the lookout for them in his police department. Uh, and, you know, I named some of the groups, but there were, there were numbers of groups that were targeted. Uh, Jewish people were the largest group, also Marxists, trade unionists, uh, social democrats, churches that did not uh, accept the authority of the Nazi party, uh, criminals and people with asocial behavior like homosexuals and, and the Roma, anybody that considered outside the norm. Uh, people began uh, then to be rounded up and put in concentration camps. In January 1939, I told you the Einsatzgruppen was formed. The Einsatzgruppen were killing squads. Originally, they were to go around and round up uh, Polish people and put them in concentration camps and get them. And then when Germany attacked the Soviet Union, they then began to target all Jewish people of arms-bearing age. Eventually, they just began then killing all Jewish people they came across. Sometimes entire villages. They went into villages and rounded up all of the Jewish people in a village, and they would march them outside of the uh, village. They would dig a big trench and stand in front of the trench and shoot them. That's what the Einsatzgruppen did. Now, imagine if that was your job every day. I mean, people were doing that as a job. Heydrich invited officials from throughout uh, the German Reich to a conference in January of 1942. In a village just outside Berlin, uh, a country known as the Wannsee Conference. And at the Wannsee Conference, he coordinated these different uh, divisions of the right to develop a final solution for the Jewish question. That's how he put it. Throughout Europe, what it amounted to was a plan for the physical annihilation of all European Jews. All agencies of the right were instructed to cooperate with this plan. So that, that's this guy right here. So when you talk about the Holocaust, he's, he's the one that headed up the development of it. Uh, he also then was appointed as the Reich Protector of Bohemia and Morovia, which was part of Czechoslovakia that was under German control. And he was living in Prague. In May of 1942, his car was attacked by, by uh, uh, two Czech agents. They threw a grenade at his car. He was wounded, and he died in early June of infection. But that did not kill the plan he developed. It continued to be carried out. All right, we've heard, we, we probably all heard of uh, some of the concentration camps, and probably the largest ones, the main ones, but let me give you another number. Between 1933 and 1945, there were 40,000 concentration camps built throughout Europe. The camps were used to provide
provide forced labor. They were used to detain enemies of the right. They were used for mass murder. There were main camps, satellite camps, and killing centers, extermination camps. This map shows you the killing centers. There were six of them. Six camps that were designed to exterminate Jewish people in gas chambers. They were all in Poland. In total, they executed about three million people in these camps. Kelmino, <coughs> Treblinka, Sobibor, Belzic, Majinek, and Auschwitz. Of those, Auschwitz is the largest, and Auschwitz is the only one of the six that was also a concentration camp, a labor camp. So Auschwitz was not solely a killing center like the others. So the others were very small, very small in size, because nobody was staying there except those that worked there. They were bringing people in solely for the purpose of murdering them immediately and disposing of the bodies. Now, Auschwitz was a little different in that sense. That was happening at Auschwitz, but Auschwitz also was a place where many slave laborers were uh, being kept. All right, this is an aerial view of Auschwitz complex in 1944. Now, I say complex because there are several camps within this area. But let me just, uh, again, talk to you about Auschwitz now before we get into it. What is Auschwitz? Auschwitz is a place that's become the essence of evil. When we mention Auschwitz, we think evil. It was a place that was built by human beings to murder human beings. It had high electrified barbed wire fences around it. It had guard towers surrounding it. It was the largest concentration camp and extermination center built by the Nazis. It was built a, a close to uh, Krakow, Poland, at a, at a town called Ostium. The German name for Ostium is Auschwitz. It was built near rail intersections and road intersections for travel, easy travel in and out. It was established originally in 1940 as a labor camp for Polish prisoners in an old military base. And eventually it was expanded to the vast labor and death camp that, it, that comes to be known. In March of 1942, Jewish people from all over Europe were rounded up, put in cattle cars, and transported to Auschwitz to be systematically selected and murdered in the camp. Those that weren't murdered were dehumanized. They were registered. Uh, their clothes were taken away from them. They were deloused. Their heads were shaved. And they were tattooed. No longer a name, but now a number. Now let me tell you this, because uh, uh, sometimes people don't know this. Auschwitz was the only camp that tattooed its prisoners. None of the other camps did that. So sometimes when they liberated other camps, there were people there with tattoos on their arms. That's because at some point, they had been in Auschwitz. Because sometimes they transferred these people the laborers from one camp to another uh, to be laborers elsewhere. But if they had a tattoo, they had at some point been in Auschwitz and registered there. Auschwitz was, uh, our, the complex consisted of the main camp, Birkenau, Monowitz, and at least 40 subcamps. The main camp was located on the old military base and it housed between 15 and 20,000 prisoners. Birkenau, the largest area of the camp, uh, also known as Auschwitz II, was about two miles from the main camp, and it housed over 100,000 prisoners. It had four gas chambers and crematoriums, Auschwitz II, Birkenau, had four gas chambers and crematoriums, 
capable of killing as many as 6,000 people per day. Monowitz, also known as Auschwitz III, was located about six miles from the main camp, and it housed about 12,000 prisoners, and it was a camp where the, the uh, uh, prisoners were used as laborers in the IG Farben plant, where they made synthetic oil and rubber, which was uh, just outside the town of Oldfield. So they built a camp adjacent to the plant. Dr. Browning, I can't see my notes. <laughs> <laughs> I can do most of it without, but I need to go into it. I'm in the right place. Sorry. Um, And then there were over 40 subcamps. These subcamps were attached to industries, mines, agricultural areas, uh, ironworks, places where they needed slave labor. Sometimes these subcamps housed only a dozen prisoners and sometimes as many as a couple of thousand. And there were 40 of those. In all, about 25,000 in the subcamps. Um, Throughout the camp's existence, there were over 8,000 SS officers, or, or soldiers who worked at the camp, and about 200 female guards that worked at the camp. Now, after the war, of those 8,200, 673 were tried uh, for war crimes. And of that 673, 41 were either sentenced to death or life in prison. About 49% were given terms of two to three years in prison. Most of the rest were, were acquitted. So this is a map of the uh, picture you just saw. This was the main camp. This is the village of Auschwitz. This was the main camp, the old military base. This is Auschwitz I. This is Birkenau, the largest area of the camp, which was about two miles from uh, the main camp. And then this was Monowitz. This is the IG Farben uh, plant. And this is Monowitz, which is about six miles from the main camp. So here's another guy we've got to talk a little bit about. Rudolf Hess. He was the commandant of Auschwitz who served the longest. He wasn't the only commandant of Auschwitz, but he was the longest serving, and he was the commandant at the beginning and at the end. There were some others in between. He was assigned to some different roles in the concentration camp system um, through the war, but he was the commandant of Auschwitz at the beginning and the end. This gallery is right here. In 1947, he was hanged at, on these gallows inside Auschwitz I. After he was tried in war uh, trial in Poland. But while he was in prison awaiting trial, he wrote his autobiography. Now, some of you may have read it. It's called uh, Commandant of Auschwitz, the Autobiography of Rudolf Hess. And I've read it, and I also have read the transcript of his trial. And he didn't deny the things that happened at Auschwitz. He didn't take blame, but he didn't deny it. He simply would use the excuse I was following orders, or I didn't realize that brutality was going on in the camp. This is an over, uh, a, a, a aerial view of Auschwitz I. This is the old military base. Uh, there was a wall around this area. These were the barracks. There was one gas chamber crematorium inside Auschwitz one located right here. The commandant's house was right here. But he didn't know all the brutality was going on. This is an aerial view of Birkenau, Auschwitz II, and I'll, I'll talk more about this area in a minute much larger area. 
This is an overhead view and a map of Auschwitz three um, monoliths, which was a much smaller camp, but it housed 12,000 prisoners adjacent to the IG carbon plant. This is the IG carbon plant where they were producing synthetic oil and rubber. And they were using the slave labelers here. Everybody's probably seen a picture similar to this uh, over time. I, I took this picture uh, going in the gate of Auschwitz I. This is the main gate of Auschwitz I. Or Bachmach Frey, I don't know if I'm probably mispronouncing that, but it means work makes you free. That's what uh, these prisoners saw when they went through the gate. Just inside the gate right here, to the right, is this building. This is the area where the camp orchestra would play. I'm kind of going to give you a little tour of, of Auschwitz right now. Uh, quickly, I can't show you everything, but that's, that's kind of what I'm doing here. Um, the orchestra would play here as the prisoners exited and entered the camp each day, as the laborers did. They also were, uh, there was no labor on Sunday. That was the only day of the week. They didn't work. The orchestra was forced to play on Sundays. And the orchestra was forced to play for Nazi officers whenever they decided they wanted the orchestra to play. These are barracks inside Auschwitz I. You can see their brick buildings. They look like military barracks. They were built to house four to 600 people. Each one housed over 1,200 people. You can see the barbed wire electrified fences through the camp. This is the inside of one of those barracks. You can see the bunks are three high. There would be uh, as many as three and four people per bunk. There were no mattresses. There were no blankets. This is the execution wall inside Auschwitz I. Now it's located between blocks 10 and 11, and each, each of the uh, barracks was called a block. Thousands of prisoners were executed here, um, especially early on when the camp was open, as deterrents. Brothers, and, you know, if somebody did something they didn't like, they would take that person there and shoot them to deter others from doing whatever it was they decided they didn't want. Thousands of people were shot here at this place. This is crematorium gas chamber number one. It is inside Auschwitz one. It's the only one in Auschwitz one. This was originally the morgue. They transformed the morgue and the morgue had, had a crematorium attached to it. They transformed the morgue into a gas chamber. This is the hole in the ceiling where they would drop the poisonous gas pellets. Now let's move over to Birkenau, the largest of the camps. Birkenau was built in 1941 and it had four gas chambers and crematoriums in it. By 1944, as many as 6,000 per day were being executed in those gas chambers. And th this is probably the most famous photo you see. You, know, you see this photo. A lot of people take this because it's the main gate with the rail lines going into the camp with the main guard tower above. This is a map of Birkenau. Birkenau was 425 acres. This is where the uh, trains would come in. This was the selection platform. So the train would be unloaded here, and there would be an SS doctor or officer there to decide from glancing at you in an instant whether you lived or died. And if you were chosen to die, you were sent to one side. If you were chosen to live, you were sent to the other side. If you were chosen to die, you were going to be taken immediately back here. This was gas chamber crematorium number two. This was gas chamber crematorium number three. 
This is gas chamber crematorium number four, and this was gas chamber and crematorium number five. So you were going to be taken from this platform directly to one of these places to be murdered when you got off that train. If you were selected as a laborer or as part of medical experiments that were going on at Auschwitz, you would be taken to this building, which was the registration building. This area was known as Canada, and they say they named it Canada because the Germans looked upon Canada as a prosperous land. Because in this place, they registered the prisoners, shaved their heads, tattooed them, and so on. But all of their belongings that they took from the people that were murdered and those that were imprisoned were put in these warehouses. There were rows of warehouses there. And those warehouses held anything they considered to be valuable, and they sorted them. Eyeglasses, shoes, porcelain, silverware, and so on. There would be the warehouses for each of those things clothing. These buildings were uh, the brick buildings, and they were built first. Eventually, then they started building all of the barracks of wood. So all of these buildings were built of wood. These became the women's camp. These became the men's camp and, and the uh, gypsy camp. The metal uh, barracks were back here. Here's an, another note for you. If you think the Holocaust was, was something that was only going to be temporary in these concentration camps, they were adding on to the camp at the time of liberation. They were building a new section of barracks right here. Now this is the old Jewish ramp, they called it, the old Jewish ramp, uh, at Birkenau. Because normally when we, I, know, I didn't know this before I went there, um, the, the selection platform inside the camp didn't begin to be used until May of 1944 with the beginning of the Hungarian transports. Prior to that, the selections took place outside the camp walls, period. And this arrow points to where that is in, in um, a photo from the time period. These were potato warehouses here. This was the original selection platform. This is a photo of a selection taking place on that platform. So this is an aerial view of that. This is the old selection platform. They then built a rail spur inside into the camp, and this became the selection platform in uh, May of 1944. So I took this photo from the main guard tower looking into the camp. This is the selection platform inside Birkenau. And they, there were six to 900,000 people transported to Auschwitz on the old ramp. And then in, between May and July of 1944, four, over 440,000 Hungarian Jews were uh, transported to Auschwitz and brought in and selected on this ramp. Um, You can see on this side where the brick barracks, the wooden barracks were over here. You can see the guard towers and electric fences through. All of the gas chambers and crematoriums were back in this area. And the registration building was back here. This is the cattle car they have sitting on the uh, selection platform inside of Birkenau. You can see the guard uh, station attached to the train. These are photos of selections taking place. These would have been during the Hungarian transport. And you can see the officers here, they're deciding your fate at a glance. You can see the main guard tower in the background. This is gas chamber crematorium number one. It looks like this because the Nazis blew up the gas chambers as the Soviets approached the camp in January of 1945 to get rid of the evidence. But there are photos of them. This is a photo of the crematorium inside this building. Now, I, I traveled there with Eva Kaur, and, and Eva, uh, the first time we uh, went with her there, and she's standing here beside this, and, and um, she said, this is my cemetery. 
This is where my family is buried. This is the ruins of gas chamber in crematorium number two. You can see the steps are still there that went down into the gas chamber. This is a photo of it uh, from the period. This is the ruins of gas chamber crematorium number four with a photo of it during the time period. And this is gas chamber crematorium number five with a photo of it. And then you see the trees outside crematorium number five. This is the birch tree grove. And you see this photo. This is a group of Hungarian Jews who were brought to the camp. They were bringing so many into the camp per day during this period that they could not keep up with killing them all. So this grove of trees I'm sorry, that looks very peaceful was a rape waiting for death. These children, these women and men are waiting in this grove of trees to be murdered. Waiting their time. These are Zycon B canisters, which held each pellet, which was the chemical that was used to create the gas that killed those in these uh, gas chambers. These are ash ponds. Think about that. There were a number of these in the tank. As they disposed of over a million bodies, they dumped the ashes into these ponds to dispose of them. This is the registration building where they would be taken to be registered, tattooed, and so on. And this is a photo of the period of the warehouses where all of the valuables taken from uh, that was brought to Auschwitz were stored. And this just shows you the uh, vast amounts of things that were found in their brushes, porcelain, luggage, shoes. These warehouses were full of these things that had belonged to people, family. And these are just some photos inside the camp. I'll try to describe them a little bit. These were the brick barracks. If you looked into the camp, uh, they were to the left. These were the locations of the wooden barracks to the right. You can see the barbed wire and these smaller dark towers throughout the camp, inside the camp. And then this was inside one of the brick barracks. Again, you can see the bunks, and each of those bunks would often hold three or four people. Some more photos of the camp. You can see the, the larger guard towers were around the perimeter of the camp, and then the smaller towers like this inside the camp. The barbed wire electric fences. Now, most of the wooden barracks are just ruins today. They're chimneys and, and foundations. Because when the war ended, the Polish people needed supplies to rebuild their homes uh, to repair, and they came into the camp and took the wood for many of those barracks to use uh, on their own homes. So most of the wooden barracks did not survive other than the foundation. This is Eva Moses' tour. This was in 2017 uh, with her at the camp, and she was describing to me here things that she remembered from the camp. This was the site of the twin girls' barracks. This is where Eva was uh, in prison. She and her twin sister, Marion, they were saved because they were twins. She said that on the selection platform, her mother, they were, they were nine when they were brought there. Their mother was holding each of them in a hand. They were dressed alike. And an SS officer came up to her mother and said, are they twins? And then her mother asked, is that good? And he said, yes. And she said, yes. And they were taken away and they never saw their family again. Their mother, father, older sisters. And then Eva and Miriam were taken to be a part of Dr. Mengele's experiments. He did experiments on identical twins. And if one twin died, they immediately killed the other and did a comparative autopsy. Eva was part of uh, experiments that consisted of being injected with things. She called this building the blood lab. This is her inside the building. 
describing to us what would take place there. Three days a week, they would be taken to this building, they would be put in a chair, their arms would be strapped to the chair, and in one arm they would be injected with things, and in the other arm, blood would be drawn. They never found out what they were injected with. Um, Dr. Mingle's records were never recovered. And then this is the building she called the Observation Lab, and it was in Auschwitz One. And she said three days a week, they were marched the two miles from Birkenau to Auschwitz One and taken to this building, where she said they were stripped naked, every part of their body was measured each time they were taken in there, and then they were simply observed. They, she said some of them would sit and make notes about everything they did. And she talked about how humiliating that was. And then this is Eva, both trips I went with her standing on the selection platform. And it was extremely powerful to hear her tell the story I just told you about the last time she saw her family. She's showing us her tattoo here. Her tattoo was A7063. And then in 2017, she read a letter of goodbye to her parents standing on the platform. Because she said she never got to tell them goodbye in 1944. So as January of 1945 rolls around, um, the Soviets are closing in on Auschwitz. They're, they're beginning to move into Poland. And the Nazis realize they're not going to be able to hold, hold the uh, Soviets off at this point. So they decide we've got to get rid of the evidence. That's when they blow up the gas chambers and they take many of the prisoners on what comes to be known, to be known as the death march. 60,000 prisoners from Auschwitz and its subcamps were marched over 30 miles in freezing temperatures with no winter clothing, no food. If they slowed down, they were shot. Many died of starvation of exposure to the cold. 15,000 of the 60,000 died during that death march. And then they were marched to trains where they were in uh, 30 miles to, to an area where they could put them on trains, and then they were transported to other camps where they would continue to be used as slave laborers. January 27th, 1945, the Soviet army liberated Auschwitz. And they recorded things they found there, with video, with, with movies, with uh, photographs. This is a famous picture of Eva Kor and Marine Corps. Soviets took this photo at liberation. This is a, they have a large copy of that photo on the wall in one of the buildings at Auschwitz One. This is Eva's pointing to herself in the photo here. Um, when the camp was liberated, they found 7,000 prisoners still there. Those that were still there were either too weak to, to get up and move, or they had hidden, or they were children. They left behind 451 children, among those even the Marian poor. So to wrap up, uh, I'll throw some numbers at you again, just, just to make sure it's hitting home. 1.3 million people were deported to Auschwitz between 1940 and 1945. Of those 1.3 million people, 1.1 million of them were murdered. Of those 1.1 million murdered at Auschwitz, 90% were Jewish. The three people you see in this photo are all Auschwitz survivors that I had the opportunity to hear tell their story. This is Magda Brown. She passed away about two years ago. She was uh, a teenage girl at Auschwitz and was later taken uh, to 
another camp as a slave laborer. She was a, uh, I heard her speak at the Illinois Holocaust Museum. She was a regular volunteer at the Illinois Holocaust Museum. This is Eva Moses Poor, whom I told you some about. And then this is Stan Kalmanovitz. And Stan wasn't, wasn't one who would tell his story publicly, but I got to have lunch with him while I was at a, a program at Candles and uh, many some others, and, and he did tell us his story. He was a part of the death march out of Auschwitz, and he told us about after they marched them for 30 miles and how cold it was, and, and they were so hungry, and they put them on flatbed trains. They weren't inside cattle cars, so they're outside still in the cold on these trains, flatbed cars. And he said as they went through Czechoslovakia on the train, people were standing on the bridges above the rail throwing food to them. And that the Nazis opened fire on those people on those bridges uh, to keep them from giving the people food. But like I say, I had the uh, privilege of hearing these and, and a number of others uh, tell their stories of the Holocaust. So, in conclusion, 90% of the Jewish population of Poland died in the Holocaust. 2.8 million. Only of, think about this, only 11% of the Jewish children that were alive at the beginning of the Holocaust in 1933 survived. Only 11% of the children survive. 33% of the adults, only 33% of the adults survive. 12 million people were murdered in total. 6 million of those were Jewish. We can't forget this. That's why I, I kind of long ago with my students uh, decided I had to teach about this. Because people need to know, people need to understand that the evil that can happen if we stand by and allow it to. So I thank you for your attention today. At this point in time, if anybody has questions for Bruce about the Holocaust, Auschwitz, anything that he is able to answer, he will try to answer for you. So, we'll try to get to you. Her, her sister died in 1995, I believe it was, and uh, she had her kidneys never developed from the size of a 10 year old. So they think probably it was a result of something she was injected with, but Eva donated a kidney to her when her kidneys began to fail, but then she developed cancer and she died in 1995. I'm Fuller is my name. Um, I was stationed at Bergen Middleton, it was up in the British zone. They had a tank gunnery shoot there in 1959 when I was there. And they had a monument that 50,000 Russians killed there, and another one was 60,000 Jews. But what impressed me was it was a mound of dirt about 12 feet wide, 2 feet high, flat on the top, with a little wooden sign about this big that says 19, April 1945. They were like buried 650 bodies. They had all these dead people and they just did the trench with a bulldozer and shoved them in and covered them up. Amazing, and I, yeah. I, I've seen uh, film footage of, of that. It's astounding. My name is John Dow. It's not a question, it's a comment. I've been there too, and it's bad. But for people who don't want to travel that far, if you go to Washington, D.C. and go to the museum there, it is unbelievable. I tell people to go in the afternoon, but when you get finished, you're going to go home for the public. Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. The, the National Holocaust Museum is an amazing museum. And, and it, like Auschwitz, that they're unlike other historical places you visit. You know, I, I've been to historical places 
all over the world, well, not all over the world, in Europe and the United States. <laughs> uh, but uh, I've never been to a place like, like Auschwitz or like that museum. You go in and it's just silent. Went through nicely, and I've read several articles about people who would deny that the Holocaust ever happened. What was their rationale? What were they trying to prove by denying such? <laughs> who were these people? Well, you know, there, there are still people that do that, and, and that's a good question. What, what's your motivation for that? Uh, you know, here's the thing about the Holocaust. If the Nazis were anything, they were meticulous record keepers. And they recorded these things. Now, uh, Eva testified in the trial of uh, uh, Graham, I forget his first name. He was a 95-year-old guard from Auschwitz, or, or he was a, an accountant of Auschwitz, at Auschwitz. He, he kept records of all the valuables they stole from people there. Anyway, at 95, they, they, he stood trial in Germany, and Eva testified at his trial but she said, I'm not testifying to send this man to prison. She said, he's 95, I don't think he should go to prison. But I want his testimony on the record of the things he saw and the things he did there. That's why she testified in his trial. And he gave her a hug. <laughs> he was a, a SS uh, soldier at Auschwitz and she was a prisoner there. And, uh, you know, she, that, that's the thing about Eva, and I don't know if you guys know Eva's story, but she forgave. <coughs> she forgave the Nazis. She forgave Dr. Mengele. No, it, it, it was certainly hard, and she would always tell people, because a, a lot of the other survivors didn't like the fact that she did that. But she, she, told, she always said, it's not for them, everybody's got to make up their own mind, but she said for her, it set her free. Because she was a, she, and she said, I was an angry person before that. And when she forgave, she said it was like all that was lifted. So, you know, but she always said that. She said, I can't forgive for you or you or you. I can only do it for myself. You mentioned that you live in Yes. Repeat the question. Uh, Jack Buckram said, talk about the... Museum in Terre Haute. Please discuss the Museum in Terre Haute. I certainly will because it, it's, a, it's a great museum. I used to take my students up there every year when Eva was living and, and uh, she would tell her story to them. Uh, the Candles Holocaust Museum, Eva started it to make sure her story and the story of the Mingala twins uh, and medical experiments uh, was always remembered. And it is a very nice museum. Uh, it has displays about uh, her story, her life. Her husband, Mickey, was also a survivor of the Holocaust. Uh, and his story is in there as well. And the story of Walter Green, um, I mean, um, Walter uh, Summers that I showed you the photo of earlier. His story's in the museum. And they actually, you can actually still talk to Eva there. Uh, because they did a, a uh, hologram of Eva. Originally, they chose like six survivors to do holograms of, and Eva was one they chose, and they've done some more since. But uh, she had to go out to California. They put her in this thing with like cameras all around her, and she had to, she had to sit. She said she had to sit with her hands on her lap, very still, and they would ask her these questions, and she would answer them. And they're, they got fixed. I mean, there's key words like, but you can ask her a question, and she'll answer. You. Uh, and it looks very real. So if you're up there, you can still see Eva. It's right on Highway 41. So as you go into Terre Haute and you're heading toward uh, downtown in Indiana State University, it's on the right. It's not a large building, but there is a sign out front, Candles Holocaust Museum. Uh, and if you've never been, I would recommend that, that you go up and, and tour that museum. Thank you. I have another question. Uh, two other questions for you. Um, first question uh, is uh, about Mr. James Donovan. James Donovan, you know, Con Dees and Donovan, it's a law firm here in town. Mr. Dees is actually in the West in the uh, uh, Pacific, or we're working with Donovan. 
Um, he was supposedly one of the people that tried him at Nuremberg. And the reason this was brought to my light uh, is recently, there's a, uh, there was a U-2 pilot in 1959 that was shot down over Russia. His name was Powers, and uh, he was a Russian prisoner for two years in that time, and they finally traded him in 62 for a Russian prisoner, but his attorney was James Donovan, and it's the same James Donovan that was in the Nuremberg crowd right here from Evansville, and that's a, a famous thing for happening. Can you speak to that? Well, I, I didn't know him, I never met him, but I have a good friend who was his mailman, <laughs> and that's how I know about him, because he, he told me when, when I was teaching him that, that uh, one of the uh, people on his route was one of the lawyers at the Nuremberg trials. And I don't know any details about him. It would be awesome if we could find some information about him for, for this museum. A second question, uh, Bruce, is uh, uh, the doctor, I think they called me a doctor of death, and uh, there's a Wall Street Journal about a month ago that talked about the doctor of death. Doctor of death is the one that experimented on Eva and her sister. And they said he escaped down to uh, wound up in South America and would jump around to different places. It sounded like he uh, really had to uh, play under the under the radar for most of his life, which was miserable for him. And uh, then I think he died in 79, but never really got to enjoy life because he was always scared of things. But his family in West Germany helped support his escape routes for many, many years. And this may be fiction or it may be true. I wonder if you could speak to him about him. What I can, uh, because the interesting thing is Eva did, did not believe that was him that died in 1979 because she tried to get them to do DNA matches with his children. And they wouldn't provide any DNA to prove that those were his remains. He, they, he, they claimed he drowned in South America, and then they buried him without, and then, and then later they said, oh, that was him, we buried him. Uh, and they did do dental records, and, and, I, and they say they identified him that way, but even never believed it was really him because the family refused to allow DNA to be done. So, you know, I, I, I guess it's, uh, uh, I can't say it was him or it wasn't him, I can just tell you what she said, and, and, uh, but the, the uh, dental records uh, evidently proved that it was him, but, they never recovered any of the records of any of the experiments he did. So all of those people that were injected with things, that things were done to, they, they don't know. Uh, and, you know, I don't know if those records survive somewhere. Um, you know, if his family knows where they are, they, they've never told, they've never uh, turned them up. But, you know, think about this guy. Uh, what, what kind of mind, I mean, you're a doctor, Dr. Brown, would, would uh, allow you to take a human being and, and do such things to them. I mean, it, it's it's unfathomable. You know, doctors are supposed to save people. Any other question here? Yeah, sorry about that. I don't know what that um, my father served in World War II. Uh, how close was Alsace-Lorraine area to the goings on in Germany? Anybody know the answer to that one? I, I'm not sure. All these troops, I mean, for the final revolution, they were, they were taking trains away from military goods. Sure. They, they were using, they, the final solution was so important to them that they took trains away from the military. When you say the going on, you're talking about the camps? The camps, the activities, the whole program to get rid of the Jews. I mean, fairly close. Uh, Yeah, I think they went through there, sure. Any other questions from the audience? Okay. Bruce, I have a picture that was just up. It said, Arbeit macht frei. What is the translation of that? Do you know? Work makes you free. Say it out loud. What is the significance? Work makes you free. 